Well, good morning. Welcome to Vineyard Church. Man, I love that video. It just gets me pumped. Today we're talking about Choose Joy, and we're really kicking off a series, a three-part series. Over the next three Sundays, we'll be talking about what it looks like to choose joy, and I am excited for this series. I've been looking forward to it all year long. But first, I want to take a moment, look into the camera, and say welcome to all of you who are joining us online. We're one church that meets in Virginia Beach, as well as all over the world, thanks to technology. So we are glad you're here. Vineyard, would you help me welcome those who are joining us online today? We're glad you're here. Welcome. We love you. Well, hey, we're talking about Choose Joy and what that looks like. And over the next three weeks, we're really going to dive into this. And this series was really birthed out of prayer. At the end of the year, I always like to take some time in December <clears throat> after the Christmas services, because Lord knows I need some rest after that. But I also like to dive into some time of prayer and solitude with the Lord and really to seek out his heart for what he has for me, for my family, for this church in the coming year. And it was back in December of 2020, feels like forever ago, that the Lord, when I was praying, he really gave this word to me. It was joy, joy. And I don't know if you remember December, a lot was going on then. The social and political landscape was uh, a little crazy to say the least. COVID, the first vaccine, had just been approved at that point, but the distribution was slow, the rollout was slow. It felt like the end was not in sight. And so to receive this word joy, it was very, it was unique and powerful, really. And I didn't understand it all, but I don't think that's my responsibility. My responsibility and our responsibility when we hear from the Lord is to share it, yeah. to speak it. And so if you've served on the Dream Team, if you serve on the Dream Team, if you've been in small groups here at Vineyard this year, you've probably heard me say at some point, that I really believe 2021 is a year of great challenge for Vineyard, but also a year of great blessing. And I believe that. And I believe as we're heading into the fall here, there's even more. It's just harvest time. You see that in the Bible, that God does something during harvest time, right? And it's more than just crops. He's into really uh, harvesting his people and really restoring identities that are lost and healing the brokenhearted. He's into rebuilding his people. And I just believe that's for, has been happening, and is, there's more coming for here, us at Vineyard. And so I want to really dive into this topic before we get into the fall. You know, we're a little over halfway through 2021, and I just want to spend some time looking at what it looks like to choose joy. What does that really mean, Samuel? What does that mean? Well, there's a passage on your outline. It's the first uh, passage. It's from Isaiah at the top of your outline. And what this is is it's from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, and this passage is actually talking about Jesus Christ. And we know that because it was written hundreds of years, uh, hundreds of years later after it was written. Jesus goes into the temple, opens up the scroll of Isaiah, reads this passage, and says, today it is fulfilled. Today the scripture is fulfilled. Okay, and so I want to look at a particular, there's a particular verse in there I want to look at. But for those of you who want the deep, you know, let's go deeper sometimes. I encourage you to look at that passage closer throughout this week, and you'll find the four parts of our vision of a church in there. Jesus came to preach the good news, the good tidings for people to come, have a relationship, to know God. He came to heal the brokenhearted. That's what we call finding freedom. He came to replace beauty for ashes. In other words, there's things that were taken from us, like our purpose that he wants to restore. And then finally, he's mobilizing they, the scripture says they, that's us, to raise up former desolations. That's making a difference. He's created us to make a difference as well. But there's a particular verse in that passage. It's verse 3. I can't get away from it, and I pulled it out on your notes specifically. It's the third verse. It says, to give them. And I want to pause right there. See, there's so many people I know uh, that follow God that really lives li live lives less than what God has for them. Let me say it this way. God has so much for his children, so much for his people, and there's so many people that settle for less. And it's, this is huge because Jesus, when he died on the cross, it wasn't just for you to spend eternity in heaven with him. It was for you to experience Jesus right now, to live with that right now. And John 10, 10 says to experience, Jesus came for you to have the full measure of life. And this is huge. So to give them, that's you and I, Jesus died to give us the oil of joy for mourning. So every place we're miserable, where there's, where there's hurting, there's pain, Jesus came to give the oil of joy. What does an oil do? It like coats, right? It like soothes. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. 
And I want you to notice there, you can star, circle, highlight the spirit of heaviness. Here's why. Because I think too many people think it's just circumstantial. Let me say it this way. 2020 was a tough year, wasn't it? There was COVID. There was riots. There was shootings. Shoot, there's floods. There's fires happening now. I mean, it just goes on and on. And some of you might be saying, well, Samuel, you're a pastor. You have to say it's spiritual. No, no. I'm not saying it's not all, there's not natural things involved, but never forget, friend, that there is a spiritual element at work. And we know that because the Bible says there is an enemy, his name is Satan, and he has a plan for your life too, if you didn't know that. It's to steal, kill, and destroy your life, to ruin your life. And so there's a spiritual heaviness that's been present in our world the past year especially. It's been heavy. And so what do we do with that? Why do I highlight that? Well, here's the important part is, We can want those things to change, right? But they don't always change. And what I see so many people get trapped doing is they sit back and go, God, when are you going to change that? When are you going to fix that, God? And I do think some of those things need to be fixed, but it doesn't always change. It doesn't always get fixed. That's the reality we live in. And really, I think so many people sit back and wait on God. When are you going to change that? I'm not in until you change that. And the reality is, I believe, and what we see in Scripture is that God really wants to come alongside you in the midst of that trouble and show you how to have joy in that. He wants to restore that. He wants to walk with you through that. Here's the kicker, though. Here's the kicker. And this is why we're doing a three-part series. It's because we have to choose it. We have to choose the joy the Lord has for us. And I'm going to show you how we step into that, how we can make those choices, but at the end of the day, you have to make that choice. See, the genius of a message, my friends, is not in, whoa, I've never thought about it that way before. That pastor really made me think. In other words, it was confusing. (laughs) That's not what a genius of a message is. The genius of a message is when it's something you've heard before, and then you decide to actually do it. When you take that next step, that easy step that you've heard, it's just a reminder And that's what scripture is. There's a reason the Bible's been around for a long time. It's simple reminders of how to walk out our faith. And so I want to show you some choices we have to make, okay? This past summer, we just wrapped up our Vineyard Network summer small group semester. It ended last week on Serve Day. And this past summer, my wife Olivia and I co-led a exercise group. And uh, we have a saying in the Vineyard Network, your life is your group. So you take something you're already doing and make that your group. So that's what my wife and I exactly did. We took an exercise class at the Y we were already doing, and we turned that into our small group. We invited some people from church, and uh, the goal was to come together in community and to slim this part out, you know, to work on some things. And, uh, you know, it was good. It was a great group. Well, we would have this teacher lead the class, and from time to time we would have a substitute teacher come in. And she was this young woman who... I really spent some time trying to figure out the best way to describe her, and what came to mind was an explosive firework. You know, we just had July 4th, so I was like, that's it. <laughs> that's how you describe her. She would come in, and she would, woo let's take that hill. Get on your bike. Get off your bike. We're going, and, which is great. I love the motivation, but it's 6 a.m. <laughs> if you're that joyful in the morning, something's broken. In confession moment, there were some mornings where I had a water bottle, and she was right in range. There were some mornings I was thinking about it. You know, after a couple group meetings, though, my wife Olivia and I went up to her and talked to her, and uh, we got to know her, and actually, and the Lord really had something in this. As we were talking to her, we got to know about her and what was going on in her life. She shared a little bit, and she had every reason not to be joyful. Work was not going well at all. Her health was really, really bothering her. She was having a lot of health problems. And in that moment, the spirit kind of grabbed me and said, Samuel, this is an example right here of choosing joy, of choosing joy. Because I've honestly been trying to grow in this value we have of choosing joy. In other words, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. I'm going to choose joy. It doesn't matter if it's 6 a.m. I'm going to choose joy. That's what choosing joy looks like. And I really want to look at a character in the Bible today. And we're going to outline a passage from one of his letters. His name is Paul. Paul, besides Jesus, is my favorite character in the New Testament. Jesus is my all-time hero. But Paul, I love Paul. He has the best attitude in the world, and he has no reason to have that attitude. If you're a book reader, I've got a book for you. You can write it down. It's an autobiography of Paul by N.T. Wright, and it's just a great book. And in that book, N.T. Wright 
describes all the things that happened to Paul. And you can find them in Scripture as well. But Paul, if you didn't know, he was an apostle, a church planter. He wrote most of the New Testament. But Paul, he had it rough. There was one point where he was actually going to trial on a ship and while, to be you know, executed for preaching the gospel. And while on that ship, going to his probable death, the ship shipwrecks. And then he's floating in the Mediterranean Sea for a night, you know, like a cork, and thinking, am I going to get eaten by a shark? Well, he finally finds an island. He climbs to the island. A snake bites him. I mean, what? You can't win. <laughs> There's a point in where he gets, the Bible says he got the lashings Jesus got. So Jesus, right before he got crucified, he got 39 lashings. The Bible says Paul got that five times in his life. Paul was beaten with these little rods on his thighs, just whipped. There was a point in Scripture where it says he was stoned, and I'm not talking about recreationally. I'm talking about with rocks, <laughs> okay? Somebody was like, well, he got some relief. Come on. <laughs> no, it was with rocks, okay? Man, this dude had it rough. But when you read his Scripture, when you read his writings, this, he has so much joy. He says, I have the victory. I have the victory. I'm hard-pressed on every side, but I'm not in despair. I have the joy. I rejoice. And this is Paul. How did he do this? How did he do this? Well, he made some decisions. He had to make some choices. And that's what I want to walk with you through today is to make some choices. And I want to look at Paul because Paul really lays it out for us. Says this in 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote this. This is a letter to the church in Corinth. He says, and I highlighted the word for you I want you to get. Sorrowful yet always joyful. I don't have a dime to my name, yet I'm always making others rich. I have nothing yet I have everything. That's Paul. There's a point in scripture where he's, they're going to cut off his head, and he's like, well, I'm not sure, you know, to live as Christ, to die as gain, so cut it off, maybe not. <laughs> what do you do to a person like that? Nothing. You can't do anything, and that's the power in choosing joy. That's the power of choosing joy, okay? And so I want to look at three choices over the next three Sundays with you that we can make choices and step in. When we make these choices and we step forward, joy is on the other side, I promise you. And so today's choice, I've called it the first choice because it really is the first choice we have to make, and that is we have to decide to pray first. We have to decide to pray first. And see, praying first is a part of who we are as a church here at Vineyard. We start off the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting, and it's not just fasting for losing the holiday weight. It's (laughs) prayer as well. You know, and really it's less about the fasting, more about the prayer, honestly. But it's beyond that. You know, you're here on a Sunday Good job. Starting off your week with church, right? We pray and we worship. There's a reason. We're starting off our week that way. But it shouldn't end here. Tomorrow morning when you get up, what should you do? Pray first. You should pray. Before you go to work, you should pray first. Before you send that email, you should pray first. Before you post on Facebook, you shouldn't post. (laughs) No, you pray first, right? You pray first. You pray first. If you've ever asked me or any of our dream team, for, you know, advice or counsel, what do we usually say first? We say, did you pray about it? And the reason we do that is because we're reminding ourselves as well as you, we're not going to be a people who act first. We're going to be a people who pray first. That's why I wanted you to get this thought here. It's that prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. Amen? Should not be our last resort. Too many people have what I call fire alarm prayers. Fire. In other words, they say, God, I got it. I'll let you know if I need help. And I think I got it. And then it falls apart. And God, I need your help. That's, that's a fire alarm prayer. That's a fire alarm prayer. And I don't really think that's where joy is found. I think joy is found in different, a different type of prayer life. And so I want to unpack verse by verse this letter in Philippians. Really, it's the book of Philippians. But we call that a prison epistle or prison letter. Paul wrote this. And it, it's called a prison letter because he was supposed to be preaching somewhere. And he got arrested and thrown in a dungeon. And so he said, I'll redeem the time. I'm going to write this letter to a church I started. And so that's what the book of Philippians is. And Paul is in this dungeon. And I want you to imagine with me, it's not like prison today where there's three squares a day. You get meals. There's, you know, structure. It's not perfect, but there's some structure. That's not how dungeons were back then. Dungeons were really just temporary holding places before you went to trial. So there was no structure. There was no food. And really, something's not changed about government. It was slow to get you to your trial. So you would be in this dungeon for long periods of time. And if you didn't have family or friends bringing you food, you could starve. You could starve. So Paul's in this situation, bleeding, starving. 
And yet he writes this letter, and in it we see that he says 27 times, rejoice. Choose joy. Rejoice. Be joyful. How did he do that? Well, let's look. I think he has some moral authority on this particular topic. So we're looking verse by verse in Philippians 4. This is Paul. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. How do we do that? Well, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. And then Paul proceeds to talk about, which we'll look at, prayer. Prayer. The Lord is near through prayer. That's how we get near to the Lord. And so Paul really lays out, which we're going to go verse by verse, five things that in and through prayer, when we walk through this, through prayer, it produces joy. It produces joy. This is the power of prayer. That's what we're talking about today. So this is the first one. It's on your outlines. The first one is that prayer replaces worry. Prayer replaces worry. I don't know about you, but I always go, often go into my prayer time worried, worried about things, worried about, you know, my finances, my family, uh, work, the church, the, my future. I come in worried. And the English root word for worried is actually to strangle, to strangle. It can feel like you're choking, you're choking. And some of you in here, when I just said that, you feel that way. Ooh, that's what that's like, you know, that stress, that anxiety, that pressure can feel like you're choking. And it's, you haven't been able to pinpoint what it is because you're worried. You're worried. That's why Paul, I think, says this. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Here's why. Worry borrows from the future. Let me say it this way. When we worry, we're giving emotions here in our present that really belong in our future. They say, if you worried about something in the future and then it came to pass, you worried twice. If you worried about something and it didn't happen, you worried in vain. See, we're giving emotional energies in our present that belong in our future or might not belong in our future. And I can relate with you, you know, when I hear what's going on in the world through news and what's happening in culture, and I can find myself asking, God, where's it going? What do you do? Are you doing anything in this? And that's why Jesus says this. Jesus says in Matthew, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? <laughs> so good. Jesus says this, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day holds enough trouble of its own. Amen. <laughs> it does. And once again, I can empathize. You know, I find myself in just two months here, two and a half months, I'll be welcoming uh, my daughter into the world, and I find myself getting worried at times. My wife, Olivia, will try to talk to me about what color should we paint the nursery, how should we set it up, and I'm not kidding. You can ask her. My mind will jump ahead into her future, and I'll start to get, I can't breathe. I'll start to be stressed, an anxious, because I see, you know, I, I help pastor here, and I see what some of the young people are struggling and working through, and I start to get nervous. What is, how is my daughter, how is Lily going to handle that? How is she going to walk through that? And really what's happening there, friends, is I'm worrying and I'm missing out on what God is doing right now. See, let me say it this way. I should be enjoying the blessing my wife is in painting that nursery and really what God has for me right here and now. When I worry, I'm missing that. When we worry, we miss what God is doing right here. And really worry reveals something. What we worry about, it reveals something about our relationship with God and our condition of prayer. See, what we worry about most reveals where we trust God least where we trust God least. So what do we do? We release our worries to God. That's what we have to do. We're not going to try to control something we're not good at controlling anyways. I'm not going to spend energies on something I'm not really changing anyways. And hey, even if it does go bad, why not be present in the joy God has for you right now? Because there is joy. Remember, the Lord comes alongside you where you are in the midst of your trouble. So prayer replaces worry, but prayer also relinquishes control. It relinquishes control. Some of you have never prayed this way. You like to co-control it with God. <laughs> it says this. Once again, Paul just outlining the passage here. By prayer and petition, petition with thanksgiving. In other words, God, I'm going to say thank you right now before I even pray it because I know you're going to answer and you're going to take care of me. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Present your request. That word present literally means lay it down at his feet. You just lay it down and you back up. You know, so many of us want to co-own it with God. We even tell, sometimes I find myself even trying to tell God how to do it and when to do it. God, I know you're busy, but you got a lot on your mind, but I need this done and 
preferably before this happened, so no rush, but, you know, help me out here. And I'm telling you by experience, that's not how God plays, my friends. It's not how God plays. He wants us to lay it down at his feet. He wants you to present it. How do I know I do that, Samuel? Well, you know you've done that when you find the peace of God, that peace that I can breathe again. That's the peace of God which transcends all understanding. See, and I want you to learn this lesson in prayer. It's that it can't be God's problem and my problem at the same time. We have to give it to God. We have to let it go. We have to present it, lay it down at his feet. Samuel, are you sure about this? Yes, I am. First Peter says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That word cast, I looked it up this past week in the Greek lexicon because the New Testament was written in Greek, and sometimes when you go to the original wording, you can get a deeper meaning. And that word cast literally means to throw it on. Here you go. And you're not holding on. There's no, like, hold on to it. It's whoop. It's like throwing something overboard. It's cast off. That's why I like the Phillips translation of that First Peter verse. You can throw the whole weight of your anxieties upon him, for you are his personal concern. So what do we do? We throw it on God. We throw it on. That's why we have prayer teams up front at the end of service. They're not just here for, you know, to show people up here. They're here to help you throw it on God. Let me say it this way. You need to talk to God about that thing that's on your shoulders right now but you're not supposed to leave this room with it. You can either leave it here or you can take it with you. You can't do both. You can't. And that's why this is my prayer for you. It's that may the God of hope fill you with, let's say this together, all joy, all joy, all joy, and peace as you trust in him. Trust in him. That's how we do it. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I never said it was. But you have to choose. You have to choose to trust in him. You have to choose it. So prayer, it replaces worry. It relinquishes control. And the third thing we do in and through prayer is that prayer regulates thinking. Prayer regulates thinking. If you know me, you know I like to encourage and I like to be a positive person. I'm not a hard, in-your-face kind of preacher. Uh, But if you give me 30 seconds, I want to say something. And this is because the Holy Spirit's pinged me on it, and I care and I love you. And that's that, you know, nowadays I think we have too much junk coming in our ears and our eyes. And it's through sensory media. In other words, Instagram, Facebook, Netflix. These things are coming in. And and this is speaking from testimony. I think we've gotten to a place where we say to ourselves, I know how to filter out the trash. And that's not true. Why? Because the filter is still inside of you. We can't filter out that stuff. And what happens is it gets stuck on what I call your hard drive. Your hard drive, it gets stuck there. It gets stuck. And that's why prayer, this is one of the most powerful parts of prayer. Don't miss this. Prayer, when we pray, the word says God washes us. He cleanses our mind. He takes that hard drive and gets the viruses, the malware off. That's the power of prayer. God washes out my mind, and we need that. That's why Paul Continuing on in that passage says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, lovely, admirable, pure, praiseworthy, think about these things. Where? Remember, he said before, in prayer. In prayer, we dwell on these things. In other words, I'm going to put my eyes on God, and I'm not going to concern myself with the affairs of earth for a moment. In this prayer moment, I'm going to really focus on God. I'm going to talk to God. And I'm not going to talk to him ad nauseum like he's not listening. No, I'm going to have a conversation. What does that mean? It means I listen too. Does that mean you'll be in some silence? Probably. But that's in prayer. We just put our eyes in God. And when you do that, friends, if you can make it through the silence, you'll start to understand what the voice of the Lord sounds like. The word says the Lord, we look for him in the fires and in the earthquakes, but it's in the still small voice, right? You have to be quiet to hear that. But when you start recognizing that voice, it's like picking up the phone and your mom or dad calling you. You don't even have to look at caller ID, right? You know who that is. Oh, that's my, my daughter. I know who that is. Same is true with the Lord. That's why it's a relationship, right? We have to spend that time. It says this in Colossians 3, that we need to think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. See, too many people think that in prayer, we're trying to get God to come to us, but really in prayer, we're going to God. We're going to God. C.S. Lewis said this. He said that if we aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. If we aim at earth, you'll get neither. See, we're going to set our eyes on God. We're going to spend some time really just focusing on God and listening to him. That's what we do in prayer. 
So prayer replaces worry, it relinquishes control, it regulates my thinking. And then the fourth thing is that through prayer, we reveal contentment. Once again, I don't know about you, but I go into prayer going, I need, I need, I need, I need this, I need that. And when I'm done praying, I walk away saying, I have everything I need. Man, God, you're really all I need. See, and I think, especially in America, my friends, this is a danger. We can slip into this very easily, can't we? It's always the next thing. We need this. The finance is trouble here. If I just had a house, if I just had this, that car, if it was just working. I mean, it's always, and I'm not saying we don't have genuine needs, but I think sometimes we think we need more than we actually do. And we can get in this place where we're, I need, I need, I need. And Paul says this. He says that in and through prayer, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. But I've learned the secret of being content. What is that? Well, remember earlier, the Lord is near. It's through prayer Paul learned the secret of content. Every time I get close to the Lord, I re-experience that secret. That's why I think the psalmist David said this. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. Let me add this word. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. I have all that I need. This has been one of my prayers lately, and I encourage you to add this to your prayer life. It's, I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. I don't need to trust in those things. I trust in the one who provides all the things I need. So prayer replaces worry. It relinquishes control. It regulates our thinking. It reveals contentment. And then finally, prayer relies on God. Prayer relies on God. And in and through prayer, we learn to rely on God. So as I said, there are genuine needs we have, but every time I have a genuine need, where do I need to go? To the Lord. I need to confess, Lord, I, I genuinely need this. And I promise you, friends, hear this. He is faithful. He will meet those needs. And it might not look like what you think it should look like, but he takes care of us. His word says he has plans to prosper us, not to harm us. He takes care of us. Philippians 4, Paul again going down. I can do everything. I can be a good husband. I can be a good wife. I can be a good father. I can make it through this week. I can. I can. Paul, verse 19, and my God will. Two powerful phrases. I can and my God will. When we put those together, man, it's dynamic. My God will meet all of our needs according to his glorious riches through who? In Christ Jesus. I want to close with a verse and a story, and then we'll have one worship song, and we'll be done. But I want to close with this verse that I really want you to highlight, star, circle, put it on your, take a picture of it on your phone, put it on your bathroom mirror, whatever it is. I want this to be your theme verse for this week, okay? If you walk away with one thing, walk away with this verse. It's Proverbs. It says, those who trust in the Lord will be joyful. You know, over the past few years, the Lord has really restored some things in my life, and I am 27 years old, and I've been in ministry for 26 years and eight months, so (laughs) long time. Church started in my parents' garage four months after I was born, and so I'm like the siding on the wall. I've been here forever, and I've done everything here, and somewhere along the way, and it was a blessing, don't get me wrong, but walking out your faith on your own looks different, and you know, somewhere along the way, I lost sight of what church was supposed to look like. Church quickly became a checkbox for me. No longer did I get to pray, I had to pray. No longer was it a blessing to serve, it was a burden to serve. When I came to church on Sunday, it was check that box. And the Lord really got a hold of me about 10 years ago and restored that. But over the past few years, he's been reclaiming some things in my life, some things that had turned into checkbox that weren't checkboxes. He's been reclaiming some of those things, and specifically, prayer and worship have been two of those things. And you know, just a couple months ago, I was in Arizona with another vineyard out there, uh, just shadowing, learning some things from them, talking to some of my pastor friends out there, and I was shadowing this pastor I really look up to, and he was teaching me some things, and I was in their service, like they have a service like we do, and worship was going on, and he said to me, He said, you know, Samuel, I wish that worship had more crying and less clapping. And I was like, I don't know about that. (laughs) And if you've ever grown up in church like me or been in church at all, you know, to see 
every once in a while there seems to be this person who starts wailing, and then it all becomes about them. And I don't need a polished service, but I don't like when distractions take away from what God is doing. And so when that pastor said that, I wasn't, I wasn't sure about it. Well, fast forward a few weeks ago, I'm sitting up front right here with my wife Olivia, and Pastor Parker's up front with us, and we're worshiping, and right about song three, uh, just something happened where I felt this overwhelming sense of peace and comfort and joy. And I just, you know what happened? A tear started rolling down my face, and I sucked it back up and in my eyeball. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. <laughs> I started crying. And for all those men out there who lost respect for me in that moment, men's event next month, I'll see you there. You can pray for me at that time. <laughs> I started crying, guys. And I was like, whoa, I get it. I get it. What that pastor meant is I wish more people would experience Jesus during worship, that they would encounter a living God who cares for them. You know, and my prayer time has also gotten more intimate and sweet in the past few years here. I get up a little bit earlier. I'm not a morning person, but Jesus got up early, and man, I want to follow him. And so I get up early, and I have my Bible. I have this little 10-year journal that has, I'm horrible with journaling, so it has three lines, real easy. Uh, and I just write, you know, whatever, whatever God's doing. And I don't pray for an hour. Or, there is no time limit, friends, because it's not a checkbox. To me, it's just an, I pray until I encounter God. Some days that's 30 seconds, three minutes, an hour. I just want to meet with God because I need that. And I write down in my 10-year journal just something. And then, you know, the power in that journal, if you're not into journaling, I encourage you, this is a good place to start, the 10-year one, because it's just two, three lines. Power in that really came, I'm about into year four here, and the power really came in in the past two years when I started going to write stuff, and I saw what I had written in the past. And I was like, whoa, God, you answered that prayer. Whoa, God, you did that. At that time, that was my whole concern, and that's no, I don't even think about that anymore. See, I think so often we can forget the faithfulness of God. Just on to the next challenge, on to the next problem. And so when we go to prayer, we're reminded of those things the Lord wants for us and does for us. That's why it's so important, my friends. I'm telling you, I want this for you. You need to get this. This is so important. Look at me, look at me. This is important. See, for so long, I thought the goal of prayer was to get God to move on my behalf. I'm, not, I'm serious. God, go do it in Virginia. Go do it in Vineyard. God, go get my family. Sick them. Get, do it. God, do it. But I've realized lately that's not, that's not true. See, prayer doesn't move God towards us. What prayer really does is that prayer moves us toward God. Moves us to a place of freedom, of peace, of comfort, of joy, of joy. You want to know how to choose it? Well, it's the first choice. It begins with prayer. It's in prayer that we can choose joy every single day, no matter what's going on around us. So let's pray right now. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Holy Spirit, I just invite you. That's God's presence. You're already in this room, Lord, but I just pray, Father, that, yeah, you would open the ears of those who need to hear this. You would open the hearts. Oh, yeah, I hear that. That things that are keep coming into our mind that are coming this week or in the coming month, that, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, those things would just be silent. That, Father, we would be able to focus on you right now. So I want you to focus on God and listen to me. Because I want to I wanna break something off of you. I, when in preparing this message, I really f felt I needed to pray something specific. And that's to break the spirit of heaviness on some of you. It feels like you're being strangled. You're choking on the stress and the anxiety and the pressure. Some of you in here have even thought of taking your life because it's too much. Yeah. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, I just break that spirit right now. That spirit will have no power over your people. Yes, Jesus. Mm. That's why you died on the cross. Somebody needed to hear that not just for heaven, for right now. That you don't have to live without joy, without the absence of the Spirit right now. So Holy Spirit, come and fill your people. Open the heavens above the beautiful people of Vineyard 
that, Father, your spirit of hope and peace and joy would come. Lord, I just launch a season in Vineyard where we are going to be people who pray. We're going to be people who choose joy. And so, Lord, I just launch that right now, that it would extend beyond these three weeks. And yeah, I believe that, that it's beyond the three weeks of this series. It's actually, its purpose is people who are coming this fall, that he wants to do something in this church right now to prepare us for people who need joy. So, Lord, we just turn to you in that. We move towards you. And, Lord, we don't just ask you to move on our part. Lord, we want to cooperate with you. So would you open our eyes to the places where we're supposed to bring joy? Yeah, I hear that. Some of us, it's our families. Some of us, it's our workplaces. That we're supposed to be joy carriers, the hope of Christ. So, Lord, would you encourage your people? Yes, Jesus. Lord, there's some of you in here that are far from God. There's some of you in here that you're not right with God and you know it because when I was talking today, you felt, you felt a conviction. You felt like, man, I'm just not where I need to be with God. Friends, Jesus is so simple. To be close to God is as simple as prayer. And so that's what I wanna do is I wanna pray with you if you feel far from God, I want to pray with you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're far from God, or maybe, yeah, some of you who you gave your life to Christ at a very young age, and really you've taken back the controls of your life, and you know it, you know it. God wants you to give him the controls. You can't co-own it with God. you got to give him complete control. I want you to surrender that back to him. So what I want to do, if that's you, if I was describing you, I want to pray with you right where you are. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm not going to make you come up front. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you stand up. Or it's not about membership at this church or baptism. It's none of that, okay? It's right here, right now. It's about prayer. It's about prayer. An enemy wants to make that more cumbersome than it needs to be. It's just prayer. It's just talking to God. So what I want to do is I want to help you with the words. You just got to believe it in your heart. So if you're saying, Samuel, that's me. I need to get close to God again. I need, I need, I'm far from God and I need a relationship with him. What I want to do is I want to pray with you. So if you're going to pray with me, if you're saying, Samuel, that's me, would you just slip your hand up right now? I want to see who I'm praying with. I see that. I see that. You can raise it up high so I can see it. Yep, I see that. Praise God, I see that. Yep, yep, yep. Put your hands down. Now, if you raised your hand or you didn't, I want you to pray with me right where you are. And you can just whisper it at your seat. Would you say, Jesus, I need you. And today I accept what you did for me. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Jesus, I want a relationship with you. So I turn from my life of sin and Jesus I give it to you I make you the Lord of my life I'm going to say it this way Jesus you're my everything God you are my savior I give you my life and to the best of my ability Today, I choose to trust in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Well, Vineyard, would you help me celebrate with those who just made that decision? Praise God. Well, we're going to close with one final worship song here, and then we'll be done. I want to talk to you if you did pray with me. And if you're online, there's a button that said, I raised my hand. Go ahead and click that. If you're here in person, though, and you prayed with me, what I want you to do, you have a next step. We all have a next step. I have a next step in my walk with Christ. You know, we say it here at Vineyard, we're on a spiritual journey. We have next steps to take. You have a next step. If you prayed with me, if you raised your hand and you prayed with me, your next step is to fill out that Connect card that's attached to your program, to put your name, check that you made that decision, and drop it in the clear box. Here's why. So I can show up to your house later today. That's not true at all. 
No, nobody's come to your house. Nobody's calling you, but you weren't meant to do life alone. That's the truth. And you're supposed to be plugged into a local church because the local church is the hope of the world, my friends. And you're created to be a part of it. And so when you check that box and you drop it in there, what we do is we just send you a letter. We don't expect any reply. We send you a letter with your next steps you can take, okay? We want to help you find a church. I'm biased. I love this church. I think it's great. But there's a lot of great churches, and you're meant to be a part of one. One of those next steps is Growth Track. Pastor Parker mentioned that. Today is step three. It's taught by Pastor Sharon. It's all about developing your influence. And really, I don't, I don't think it's happenstance that it fell on today. We talk about values. That's how you develop your influence. One of our values is choose joy. So Pastor Sharon actually shares how to go into that deeper, how to walk in that skin. So I invite you to that. There's food and child care right after service. And what I'm going to do this weekend is we normally have the prayer teams up at the end of service, but I want to actually ask our prayer teams to come forward and on the sides now. And what we're going to do is I really believe there's some of you in here when I was praying for the spirit of heaviness, I broke its power, but it's still resting on you. And what I believe your next step is to come receive prayer during this last worship song and to leave it at the platform, to leave it here. You can't, you're not supposed to leave with it. And you know what that thing is. It just came to mind. That's, that's not Samuel. That's the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit just pinged that. Give that to me. And so the prayer team, they want to pray with you. And so we're going to do that as we close with one worship song, okay? Well, finally, we're going to give what's on our hearts to give. And if you're a guest here at Vineyard, please don't feel any pressure at all to participate in the giving part of the service. That's for those who call Vineyard their home. And hey, Vineyard family, we give because it's a joy. Amen. It's a joy. Here's where my joy is found, and the Lord just opened my eyes to this again the other day, is that he multiplies every single little thing I give. A little bit of my time, he multiplies it. A little bit of my finances, he multiplies it. It's the, man, there's all joy in that. And so we give because we get to. Last week we did serve day. And the power in that, my friends, what's different, why the local church is the hope of the world, because we don't just do social justice, we do spiritual justice. And people need both. Amen? Well, would you stand with me? We're going to close with one last worship song as we give. And I invite you forward for prayer. If that is you, you know who you are. The Holy Spirit's talking to you. Well, I just launched the prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, would you break the spirit of heaviness in here? Lord, would you receive our giving and our praise? Let all the glory go to you, Jesus, in the mighty name. Amen.